Hi everyone and welcome to Age of Wonders 4. So, in case you're not familiar with Age of Wonders games, it's a fantasy-based 4X franchise that goes back to 1999 and Age of Wonders 1, the first game, was really damn good for its time. It also had a, a sci-fi spin-off a few years ago, Age of Wonders Planetfall, which I personally wasn't a huge fan of. Planetfall was fine, it just didn't really click for me. And if you're wondering if Age of Wonders 4 is any good, uh, well, I can answer that question right away, right now. At least in my opinion, it's quite possibly the best new 4X game we got in the last few years. I think it's really damn good. I only have minor criticisms and they don't really affect the game as a whole. So yeah, I really like it personally. And I say this as someone who, again, wasn't a huge fan of Age of Wonders Planetfall and I was kind of neutral towards Age of Wonders 3. But I've been really enjoying Age of Wonders 4. And in this video, we'll talk about the game mechanics. I'll try to explain as much as I can. There is a lot to talk about. So, I will probably miss some details, and I will definitely not be able to discuss every single detail out there, because there are a lot of them. Anyway, before we do anything else, you probably already noticed the Pantheon up top. So, this is how you unlock some of the things in the game. You get Pantheon points basically by playing the game, including winning, but not just winning. And the unlocks here can be divided into four categories. You can unlock realms, which you unlock simply by getting your pantheon to a certain level. You don't need to spend any points on this. And the realms are basically worlds that you play in. You can unlock cosmetics, so hero customization options, hero icons for your faction's banner. You can unlock hero gear, so mostly weapons that you can start with on your hero. And finally, you can also unlock culture traits. Here's an example, mana addicts. You have a lot of culture traits available by default, but some of them have to be unlocked through the Pantheon. So that's the Pantheon in a nutshell. As you can see, I'm already at Pantheon level 28. I've been playing this quite a lot, and I only got access like less than two weeks ago. We also have the Encyclopedia, which is actually really good. A lot of strategy games have something similar, but executed poorly. This one is actually pretty well executed. So you have search, and you can search for things. You have filters, and you have categories up top. So for example, I can go to tomes, or maybe cultural units, or lore. We have different types of units. We have structures. So if I'm looking for a specific building, I can just type in the name of that building, and you will find it. You can also choose a filter over here. So for example, you can look just at province improvements and you'll get all of them here. You have several different ways to find things. And I really like that. In the main menu, uh, in the game concepts, you can, for example, select combat and you will get explanation of every single game concept that relates to combat. You also have nested tooltips, so for example, if we go into, I don't know, critical hits, right? And you'll see something about morale. And you want to see what morale does exactly in this game, you can just hover over morale, you will get another tooltip. And you can see that the low morale will increase a fumble chance. If you want to know what exactly fumble is, you can hover over fumble and you'll get another explanation. So the encyclopedia is really, really good. Highly recommended if you're unsure about something. Let's get started then. Before we actually start playing at all, we will talk about things you do before you start playing. Choose your so, new game. Here are all the realms that are available. Now, there are a few different things going on here. There are story realms, which to be honest, I haven't really touched. <laughs> I'm not much of a story guy, but there is a story of sorts in here. You start it from Story Realm 1, and I assume finishing it unlock Story Realm 2, and so on. <laughs> I honestly haven't touched Story Realms, because, yeah, again, I'm not much of a story guy. And then we have uh, all kinds of other realms divided into tiers. There's a beginner scenario, so this is basically like the most laid-back map that we can possibly have. It's good for learning the game. 
And then you have all kinds of other realms, which are progressively more hostile and difficult. At the very bottom is Desolate Realm. This is unlocked through the Pantheon. This is the very last unlocked in the Pantheon here, Desolate Realm. And you can see the description here and quite a few things going on. This is right now on the list of default realms, like a pre-made realms, this is the only tier 5. And you can see it has lava lakes, scorched climate, volcanic eruptions, hostile houses, and uh, yeah, all kinds of other things. Now, you don't have to play uh, with the pre-made realms, you can make your own one, which is the most fun part about this. So, if we click create the realm, we'll get the options to customize our realm. And there are quite a few options available here. There's a lot of customization. This is part of the game I really, really enjoy, because with all these customization options, you can create some very, very different maps in terms of like playstyle, gameplay, overall feel. There's a lot going on here. So, first of all, you have the geography trait, which basically tells the game what kind of map this is going to be. From barren oceans to coast, divide islands, just land, lava divide, lava lakes, and scar divide. So, for example, if we pick, I don't know, islands, you will get a bunch of islands in an ocean, and each empire will have their own landmass. That's just one option. If we pick lava divide, you will get two massive landmasses separated by impassable ocean of lava. Then we have, you know, lava lakes, all kinds of stuff here. Here we have a normal divide, which means you have two realms, two massive landmasses separated by an ocean. Just a normal ocean you can go across. So let's say we can pick let, divide. It's fine. Then uh, we have the climate trait. So you can go for some pretty standard stuff like desert, endless fields, frozen realm, but we also have options like forming realm, we have overgrown realm, scorched climate, highlands. So you have to pick one of those. Well, you don't have to, you can leave it unknown. So then it will not be modified by anything special. So you don't actually have to pick this. You can leave it unknown. But let's say we can pick Forming Realm. Desolate provinces are dominant. Each round, all unowned desolate provinces have a small chance of transforming into a different theme and overlay. Uh, that's pretty interesting. I kind of like that. And it's mutually exclusive with Warping Wilds. Okay, so let's take Forming Realm. Uh, we can keep Divide, I think. That's probably fine. Okay, then we have Inhabitants trait. Uh, which basically tells you what kinds of like native life you might find in here and other things. So, for example, we have wildlands, which makes wild animals very common in this realm, replacing all other infestations and ancient wonders. We have rampant undead, which means undead yogis will be common. Rampant flora, peaceful lands, megafauna, which means animal units will be common, but Marauder Animal units will also get Empowered Beasts trait, which gives them more health, makes them do more damage, and gives them the Demolisher traits, which means their attacks will damage fortified obstacles. We have Magic Origins, a low population, lingering creators, which makes Giant and Ogre units common, Immortal Spirits, which makes Ethereal units common, Dragon Territories, Demonic Realm, Astral Invaders. So, quite a few options in here. Let's maybe grab, I don't know, Lingering Creators. That's fine. So, that makes Giant and Ogre units common. Some pretty nasty stuff. Then we have Present Trait. This is one of the more interesting traits because this allows you to create a map with, let's say, third party presence. So, somebody who's already established in this land is present on the map. So, for example, Demon Prince. This realm is dominated by a powerful demonic prince of Abadoth and their minions. And whoever defeats him will be victorious. So, this will also work as a victory condition of sorts. So, for example, if you choose Archon Prophet, not only you will have the Archon Prophet on this map, and they will start with a large throne city, 
so a very developed throne city on turn one, she will start with every single free city on the map as her vassal, and of course whoever defeats her will be victorious. So uh, this makes the map quite a bit tougher, because you have a third party which vassalized every single free city on the map, and the free cities can be quite powerful. And then we have, for example, the Iron Emperor. So he starts with powerful Materium skills and plus one additional city. We can pick Druidic Alliance. So this will start the game with two powerful Druids. They start with powerful Nature skills and they also start in an Alliance. We can go for Pretender Kings. That will start the game with three different third parties. And they start with plus two additional cities. And they also start at war with the other Pretender Kings. And whoever forms an alliance or defeats each Pretender King will be victorious. You get the idea. It's a very, very interesting option. And then we have miscellaneous traits. You can have up to four of those. So some of them are mutually exclusive or cannot be used with certain other options that we already talked about. So, for example, warping fields, uh, warping wilds cannot be used with forming realm, but other than that, you can use various combinations. So, massive underground is obviously mutually exclusive with small underground, because it cannot be both massive and small at the same time. But again, you get the idea. And some of them are pretty interesting. So here, Domain of Mayhem. All combat will be affected by Domain of Mayhem. Every three turns, all units will have a base 30% chance of being inflicted with Berserk. And uh, Berserk makes them immune to morale effects. It will attack its allies if no enemy is in range. And the damage penalties from casualty will be negated. So, yeah, it's not just a small change. It's a pretty massive change. We have Wondrous Past which makes Ancient Wonders common. Ancient Wonders are very powerful, we'll talk about them once we actually start playing the game. We have, uh, for example, Banner Lords here. So, this world, three cities will make powerful allies. Rally of the Legions occur 25% more often, and all empires gain plus 5 recruitment points. This is pretty powerful. Again, I don't want to talk about these in-game mechanics yet, we'll do that once we start playing. But I can tell you this is pretty powerful in context of free cities. We have something like unlimited power. You can now cast multiple combat spells per turn, but combat spells cost 200% more mana to cast. So yeah, I think you get the idea. Marauder units gain super growth, which gives them plus 1 retaliation attack and plus 10% hit points. We have mega cities. So you cannot absorb, migrate or settle any new cities, but cities can perform province annexation up to five provinces away. Uh, this is basically like the one city challenge kind of thing. So since I picked Forming Realm, we could maybe go for volcanic eruptions. With Forming Realm, desolate provinces will be dominant, and with volcanic eruptions, desolate provinces will be affected by volcanic activity, and all surface combat will be affected by volcanic eruptions. Every two turns a marker is placed, then after one turn the ground will erupt and the units within one tile of the marker will suffer 10 physical damage and 10 fire damage. Random affected hexes will gain on fire. And then units in these provinces will suffer volcanic heat. So this unit cannot regenerate and suffers minus 3 fire resistance but gains plus 3 frost resistance. That's pretty interesting, let's go with that. It could be a fun combo combined with Forming Realm. Alright, and let's maybe pick Wondrous Past, because, you know, why not? Then you can change player distance, which is how far away from each other different players will start. Close, standard or far. Let's just go with standard. You can pick the number of players that will be in the game, ranging from 2 up to 9. So let's go with, let's say, 5 or 6. You can change the difficulty from relaxed to brutal. Uh, let's just go with the normal for now. And you can also choose the turn system. So simultaneous means, well, everyone will play at the same time. Best for multiplayer for the most part. But you can also play simultaneous turns in single player. And classic turns, which is, you know, sequential. We leave it on classic. You can give the realm a name, 
So, but I don't know. I'm pretty bad at naming things. We can name it Volcanic World or whatever. And then you can change portal visuals. This only affects uh, this uh, screen over here. This has no actual in-game effect. You can just set it to whatever it is that you want to set it to. Okay, this one looks appropriate for Forming Realm. Then we have a bunch of advanced settings. So under Factions, one of the more interested options here is Generated Rulers. Because normally, when you pick a random ruler, which is the default, the game will pick the ruler from the list. From the list of like pre-existing rulers. However, you can set it to Generated, which means it will randomly generate uh, that AI out of like all of the available options that we will be talking about very very soon. You can also team them up if you would like. You can set a handicap for a specific player if you like. And you can also change uh, the AI difficulty for any single one of them. So from very easy to very hard. Then uh, we have some game flow options. You can set a turn timer which limits how much time you can spend on a turn. I don't know why you wouldn't want to use that. <laughs> but hey, if you want an extra challenge, you can set it to short. We have some starting conditions here. So on hard, you will start with 50% less resources and a smaller army. On easy, you will start with 50% more. We have world threat, passive, low, normal or high. So on high, enemy armies will be increased in strength and increase over time at a faster rate and free cities and infestations will send frequent attacking armies. Then we have some victory condition options. So you can set a turn limit, 200 turns, 150, 100 or disabled. This is for score victory. It means that if nobody wins by turn 150, then score will be used. You know, kind of like in Civ. You can enable or disable various victory conditions. And they also have some hero settings. So uh, this dictates what happens when the hero dies during a battle, while their side is victorious. You can make it so that the hero will be resurrected if we win through auto combat. You can set it so that the hero will never be resurrected, or that the hero will always be resurrected. So that's that option. And then we have some actual combat options. So this is for tactical combat. You can set the combat versus AI to always be auto combat, always be manual combat. Same for combat versus humans and some other stuff, as you can see. You can set a timer for tactical combat. Some of these options are mostly useful for multiplayer, but you can use them in single player if you want to. Anyway, I think that's going to be it for advanced setup for now. And then you get to create your faction or pick one of the existing factions. So there are quite a few uh, pre-existing factions that you can pick, and they are mostly fine. There's nothing wrong with them whatsoever. But the real fun part is creating your own one. And there are a lot of various options that you can change. There's a lot of customization in terms of playstyle as well. So first, you have to choose your physical form. Now, this doesn't really affect anything. They do have some traits by default. So if you pick, I don't know, Dwarfkin, then by default they are tough and have defensive tactics. But you can change this to anything you want. Which means that this only really makes a visual difference. If you change the traits to whatever it is that you want them to be, the difference is purely visual. We have Toadkin. <laughs> I suspect a lot of people will play Toadkin, so I think we'll go with something else. We can go with Cat People, because why not? And there are quite a few traits in here. You have a Body Trait and a Mind Trait. So these are mostly things that are useful in tactical combat, and there are all kinds of options here. Bulwark gives you plus 2 defense and plus 2 resistance when you use defense mode. You can get plus 20% accuracy on physical ranged and magic attacks. You can get more hit points. You can be 30% harder to hit by ranged attacks. I quite like this one actually. And you can also get some bonuses for mounted units, but it will have no effect on your other units. And these are some pretty powerful bonuses actually. 
For example, spider mounts will give you more health, but also give you the web ability, which can be pretty powerful. 60% chance of inflicting immobilized for one turn. This is very good against melee units. You can get unicorn mounts with phase ability. So you can basically move to a target hex within free tile range. You can get wolf mounts. But again, if you pick the mount trait, it will have no effect on units that are not mounted. Let's pick quick reflexes. I think that makes sense thematically with cut people. And then you can pick mind trait. So uh, there are a few traits in here that give you bonuses on a specific terrain. So for example, desert adaptation means you use minus two move points on a sand terrain and you can build farms on sand terrain. But then you also have things like, let's say, elusive. So you gain plus six defense and resistance against retaliation attacks and opportunity attacks. Fast initiative. In the first turn of combat, units can move up to six hexes. Ferocious. So more damage against retaliation attacks and opportunity attacks. Overwhelm tactics. I quite like this one, actually. Plus 20% critical hit chance when standing next to a friendly unit with overwhelm tactics. It doesn't stack, though. Tenacious. So damage penalties from casualties are halved. Yeah, and a few other things. Defensive tactics. So units become tougher when standing next to allies. This one is pretty decent as well, actually. Minus 50% morale loss from all sources. Morale can be pretty powerful because high morale increases your critical hit chance and low morale increases your fumble chance. Fumble reduces your damage by 50% and very low morale further increases your fumble chance and can lead to your unit routing. It's actually a pretty decent one here. I mean, a lot of them are good in like different situations. We also have Adaptable with plus 30% experience. Experienced units can be way stronger than inexperienced units. Especially true with some specific unit types. And let's go for Adaptable. Okay, so that's going to be it for our traits. Then you have to pick the culture. So culture affects a few things. One of the most important things are units. So depending on which culture you pick, you will have different units. Because that's one of the major unit categories. There are basically three different unit categories. You have cultural units, which are tied to your culture. You have tome units. We'll talk about tomes in just a moment. They are tied to tomes. And you have basically everything else. Units you normally cannot get, but there are some ways to get them. So the culture choice is actually pretty important. You will also get some affinity based on which culture you pick, and you will get certain bonuses. So like I said, there's a lot to talk about in this game, but affinity is used for tomes, among other things, and some unlocks for empire skills. Affinity is a pretty important thing, but let me go over these bonuses real quick. So if you play feudal culture, you will get extra structures with food income. Your units will benefit from close formations with stand together. And stand together means that unit deals plus 20% damage when adjacent to another friendly unit. This is pretty powerful. And you will get feudal lords. So with feudal lords, you can grant five heroes a special feudal lord title as hero skills. They can be really, really powerful. So as an example, with a lord of crops, the city of which this hero is a governor will get 25 food income. Let me tell you, 25 food, especially very early in the game, is a lot. With a Lord of War, for example, you get 25% extra uh, move points after winning combat, and you regain 5 hit points. It can trigger once per turn on the world map. This can actually be pretty powerful. It allows you to move around faster. It allows you to recover your health faster. Each one of these is pretty powerful. So feudal lords are pretty strong. I mean, these are all strong in different contexts. Anyway, I don't necessarily want to talk about every single bonus for every single culture here and the context. 
of each bonus because then I would probably spend the next half hour talking about every single little thing over here. But the main thing you need to know is that each culture will have different units and uh, as you might have guessed, some cultures will have more of certain types of units. For example, barbarians don't really get any battle mage units and the dark culture will get uh, way more battle mage units. You can actually see all of them in the encyclopedia, but I cannot open an encyclopedia from this exact screen. But you can see all of the culture units in the encyclopedia. Then you usually get some kind of tactical combat bonus with each of these cultures. So for example, Mystic will get attunement star blades, and which means that when you cast a spell, the unit's base attack will randomly gain plus one fire damage, lightning damage, or frost damage for three turns. This basically gives you bonuses when you cast spells. That's the idea. And you usually get some extra structures that prioritize a different resource type. So with Mystic Culture, you will get extra structures with mana income. With Dark, you will get culture, you will get structures with knowledge, with industrials, production. You get the idea, right? And then there's sometimes, or usually, some kind of other bonus. For example, with the Mystic, you get Astral Echoes, which are special pickups only visible and possible to collect by rulers of Mystic culture. And with the Barbarian, you get Ritual of Alacrity. With Industrials, you get Scud Prospecting. Again, you get the idea. And depending on which culture you pick, you will get some starting affinity. So as feudal you get one order affinity and one nature affinity, as high you get two order affinity and so on. So okay, I picked quick reflexes earlier, which will make us harder to hit with ranged attacks. Maybe we'll go with a barbarian, because barbarian units are primarily melee units. They don't really get any battle mages. They don't get a lot of ranged units, which I think makes sense in this context. We will be at a disadvantage from range as barbarians, but since I picked quick reflexes, we will also be harder to hit from range. And we'll get one chaos and one nature affinity with this. So as a barbarian, we'll get access to extra structures with food and draft income. A draft is a resource used for recruiting units. We'll talk about uh, resources and yields once we get started. And our melee units which is what our army is going to be for the most part, will get Primal Strike, which means we'll deal extra damage from our first attack. And then we'll also have Ritual of Alacrity, which when activated gives friendly units on the center of the outpost or city 50% hit points restoration, 100% move points, and it removes Exhausted from Forced March. So, Forced March allows you to gain 100% of that army's move points at the cost of losing 30% of their hit points, and it costs 10 mana per unit in the army, and that army will become exhausted for two turns. Exhausted army cannot regenerate and cannot be healed using spells or support abilities. However, you have this Ritual of Alacrity, which means that you can activate this and any units on the center of an outpost or a city will lose exhausted status. All right, the barbarians it is then. We are barbarian cat people. And then you get to pick society traits. Now, there's some really fun stuff in here. And this icon right here means it's unlocked through the Pantheon, in case you're wondering. There are some really fun things in here. Now, we do have one chaos and one nature affinity, from our culture, but that does not mean I have to pick society traits from Chaos or Nature Affinity. I don't have to. I can, but I don't have to. So one pretty interesting society trait here that has to be unlocked through the Pantheon is Chosen Destroyers. It's basically one city challenge kind of thing. Because with Chosen Destroyers, you cannot obtain in your cities and conquered cities can only be raised However, raising cities will grant you a permanent plus 40 gold, plus 20 mana, and a plus 20 knowledge income, which is quite a bit. And you will also suffer permanent minus 300 relations with all three cities and all other empires. 
So this like completely changes your play style. Uh, this is a pretty interesting one. I'll probably do a game with this at some point. I don't think that's going to be right now though. So I actually really like Silver Tongued. It's a very, very powerful trade because you can make trade deals with free cities for free. This is actually really, really powerful. You can get some rare resources by trading with cities. Again, we'll talk about that once we start playing. The, all you need to know is that getting these things totally for free can be really powerful. It also gives you an extra Whispering Stone, which is something that you can use with a free city to start gaining some influence with it, but you can also use it with your own city to gain stability. And the stability gives you various bonuses. So, for example, when you have stable level, you get plus 5% production, draft and food. At orderly, you get plus 10. At harmony, you get plus 15. So I really, really like Silver Tongue, actually. One potentially fun combo is Silver Tongue and Banner Lords, because with Banner Lords, you start with the nearest free city revealed and you already gain plus 25 allegiance with them. And the Rally of the Legions will also occur twice as often. Rally of the Legions is something that allows you to get extra units and potentially units that you otherwise wouldn't have access to. Okay, but since we have some nature affinity, let's actually pick up Adept Settlers. So this will give us plus one city cap. Founding cities will cost minus 25% less Imperium and the newly founded cities will gain plus one population and our capital city will start with plus one population. This gives you some nice initial momentum for your cities. And then we will also pick up talented collectors. So this gives your cities extra yield bonuses for each magic material in their domain. So think about these as luxuries or something like that if you're a sieve guy. I think that's a decent equivalent. Not a direct equivalent, but it's something like that. And as a starting bonus, we will start with a magic material nearby. So there we go. We will be adept settlers and talented collectors. Let's go with that. And then another very, very important decision, which is picking your tome. So tomes affect not only the spells that you will get, but more importantly, you get a, an initial bonus for picking this tome, and some of these are really, really important and powerful. And furthermore, there are also tome units. So if we research, for example, well, any of these, chaplain, for example, if we research this, this will unlock this specific unit for you to recruit in your cities. So this is not a spell. This is an actual unit unlock. This right here is a spell. It's a world map summon spell. So it's easy to confuse these two. This is not a spell. This is a spell. If it says summon, it means it's a spell. If it doesn't, then it's not a spell. It's an actual unit that you unlock. And some of them can be pretty powerful. Some of them can also synergize really well with your setup, with your build. And I am mostly chaos and nature, but that does not mean I have to pick chaos or nature tome. I can pick any tome I want. This is the beauty of this system. You can pick any combination of tomes that you want. You don't need two tier one tomes to pick a tier two tome. Then you need two tier two tomes to pick a tier three tome, etc. And you can only ever have one tier five tome. And you need a minimum amount of affinity to pick uh, some higher level tomes. But other than that, you can just pick any that you want, which can lead to some really, really interesting builds and synergies. You definitely shouldn't be afraid to experiment with this. And like I said, this initial bonus can actually be really, really powerful, depending on what exact build you're going for. Some of these spells can also be pretty powerful. For example, Summon Irregulars is a spell that literally summons a random non-scout tier 1 unit that can be produced in a city on the target hex. So this is pretty nice. And there are various types of spells. I think we'll talk about that once we actually get into the game. So Spawnkin is a minor race transformation. This is basically a bonus that is constant. You have to pay upkeep in mana and it affects the entire race. Literally every single unit of that race will get plus 20% damage. Every single one. So these are some pretty powerful effects. And you can get Spawnkin right away, as you can see. So that gives you potentially plus 20% damage very early into the game. So this is a pretty important choice. 
Okay, so if we pick up Tomb of Roots, we will get plus 4 blight damage, and we already get extra blight damage from Primal Strike for our first melee attack. This is plus 8. With poison weapons, we would get additional plus 4 right here. We will also have 30% base chance of inflicting poison, which means the target unit will sustain 8 blight damage each turn. It will not affect ethereal or undead units. We will also get Herbalist, which is a special province improvement, with plus 5 food, plus 5 mana, and extra plus 2 and plus 2 per adjacent province in domain with forest or swamp. Friendly armies in this city's domain regenerate an additional plus 5 hit points per turn, and it counts as a conduit. And we'll get plus 2 nature affinity. Alright, let's go with Tomb of Roots. Why not? And these are some of the spells we'll be able to get. So we will be able to get Healing Roots, which can heal a target-friendly unit in combat. I don't think I have to tell you how useful that can be. We will get a unit enchantment. So it's not the same as race transformation. A unit enchantment affects a specific group of units while it's active. But this will give us plus 4 blight damage and minus 2 physical damage with the base melee attacks. And it will grant base 30% chance of inflicting poison. Okay, why not? Let's go with Tomb of Roots. And then you have to pick whether you want to use a champion or a wizard king. So other than these bonuses that you can see right here, one big difference is that a champion is always going to be of your race, but a wizard king can be any race. And obviously wizard king will be much better at magic, and the champion will have plus 10% gold income, more city stability, non-hero units will gain more experience, and so on. But yeah, again, the champion will always be of your culture, because he's like a champion of your people. The wizard king is not, so he doesn't have to be. Uh, let's go with the champion here. Now, there's one final uh, non-cosmetic option to pick here, which is your starting weapons. And uh, some of them are unlocked through the Pantheon, as you probably saw at the start of this video. And uh, this can be a pretty important choice, actually. So, for example, Tyrant Sword and Shield would give me not only the Feudal Longsword and Shield, it would also give me Intimidating Aura. So, that's one thing. We could get Berserker Rage. So, when this unit's total hit points reach 33% or lower, it will become Berserk and Steadfast for one turn. This unit is uncontrollable and always attacks the closest enemy target. If no enemy is in range, it will attack its allies. I kind of like Intimidating Aura, especially since a lot of our units will be melee. I think it kind of makes sense. So let's go with Tyrant Sword and Shield. I think that's fine. There you go. And past that, the rest is basically cosmetic. You just change uh, your appearance, basically. Uh, I think you can uh, hit random here. Yes, you can hit random. So you can just hit random a bunch of times until you find something you're satisfied with. Okay, I think this looks fine, as far as I'm concerned. And we could tweak it a little bit if we want to. You can play around this quite a bit. There are quite a few uh, helmet options here. Some of them are pretty interesting. Oh yeah, I like this one. <laughs> I've been mostly using this one, the bear hat. All right, and then you can also change their appearance for your entire race as a whole. So there are a bunch of options here that you can change. We can also randomize this a bunch of times. Maybe make them green or something. Uh, we can't really make them green, I'm afraid. So maybe orange or red, since we do have some chaos affinity. Okay, I think this is good enough. Alright. And then you have to actually name yourself and uh, your race. Brutal felines. Yeah, we can randomize this a few times. Barbarian cats. I mean, that's a pretty simple and yet fairly accurate description of what I made here. By the way, you can actually change the title as well. You can edit this title. Just saying, you don't have to pick a pre-existing one, you can change it. Yeah, I think this is fine. I'm pretty terrible at naming things, by the way. <laughs> so, if I try to figure out like a witty, interesting name here, I'll probably spend the next hour 
just sitting here and are not actually playing. But let's rename him to uh, Marbs. Marbs Quick Smash. We're barbarians and we have quick reflexes. So sounds good to me. Okay, and uh, that is our race. Alright, so we are finally in the game now. Uh, this is a recap of everything we just picked here. So, felines with quick reflexes, adaptable, barbarian culture with adept settlers and talented collectors. So this will start us with a magic material nearby. And this is our starting magic, so we have healing roots and the song of the reckless. So that's a buff spell, which is used in combat. For three turns, target friendly unit will gain berserk and strengthened three stacks. That's plus 30% damage, but remember, berserk means that we cannot directly control that unit. And if no enemy is in range, it will attack its allies. So need to be careful with that. Need to be careful. And healing rods, well, that will allow us to heal. Now, one very interesting concept that I like a lot in this game are temporary hit points. So temporary hit points is basically something you gain in combat through spells like this. You heal your units, but the hit points that you healed are temporary, like the name implies, and they are removed at the end of combat. So this basically means you don't have to stall to get more spells out and heal your units by the end of the fight, because you want to keep these temporary hit points anyway. And I really like that. So before we actually do anything, let me just say that I really like the map visually. I think they've done a pretty good job with it. it might not be super obvious when we can barely see anything, but it's pretty obvious visually uh, what terrain something is, what you can interact with, where points of interest are. And furthermore, if you are a little bit unsure still, what on the map right now is an actual point of interest, you can zoom out to the strategic overview map, where you will see exactly where the points of interest are. You can even enable or disable them. So we can enable or disable pickups, improvements, domains, cities, magic materials, resource nodes. You get the idea. Anyway, here's our city. I did start with two population because I got plus one city pop. Normally you start with one. And okay, there are quite a few things to talk about here. So generally speaking, the map in this game is divided into like territories, like this. It's divided into provinces, basically. And these are always preset. You can't change their shape or anything like that. This province right here is always going to be here. You cannot change that. You can only take control of it or not take control of it. By default, when you start a city, it will only control uh, the province it has been founded on. So right now, our capital only has this one single province because that's where the city itself is located. And then you can annex one province for each extra population. So when your city grows, you can annex one province when it grows. So normally you cannot annex an extra province on turn one. I can do it because I started with one extra population in my capital. But normally you would have to wait until you get to pop. And right now we can see our growth over here and we will get extra population increase in three turns at our current rate because we're getting 48 food per turn at the moment. So yeah, again, there are quite a few things to talk about here. One of the more important resources in the game is Imperium. So Imperium is a resource used for acquiring cities and speeding up empire development as well as negotiations. And you do have some base Imperium income when you first start the game, you can improve your Imperium income by building the Wizard Tower in your throne city, in your capital basically, and by annexing Ancient Wonders. These are the main two ways of gaining extra Imperium per turn. So developing your capital specifically with the Wizard Tower and getting Wonders. And one of the things you can do with Imperium is instantly increase your population. Now, I wouldn't necessarily abuse this option too much because you can spend a lot of Imperium very quickly by boosting your cities. But it can be a very useful and a very powerful feature if you use it right. If you use it at the right moment in the right city. It can really boost that city a lot and your entire empire sometimes. Depending on what your reasons are for boosting it. 
Anyway, so uh, let's talk about all of these basic resources. First, we have food, which is self-explanatory, I would hope. It's used to gain a new population. We are getting plus 48 food right now, and we will gain an extra population in three turns. So that's food. Then we have production, which is used to build city structures. Buildings are, as you might have guessed, very important. Then we have draft, which is used for recruiting units in cities. Gold is also used for recruiting units. But the draft is a resource that's used basically purely for unit recruitment. And by the way, every single resource in your cities has overflow or surplus. So that's pretty important because not every Age of Wonders game had overflow. This one does. And every single resource in your cities has overflow. It can only be kept for a single turn, but it does have overflow. The extra yield is not wasted. I'm really glad to see that. So anyway, that's draft. Draft is used again for recruiting units. Then we have gold, which is used for maintenance, but it's also used for units, also to pay units, and you know, for things you might have guessed gold is used for. Then we have mana, which is used for casting spells and summoning units. This is both spells uh, on the world map and also spells in combat. Mana is also used for actual upkeep, mostly for spells. For example, if you cast a spell that transforms your entire race or enchants, a unit type, you have to pay constant mana upkeep, you know, to keep that enchantment. Then we have knowledge, which is basically research, is used to research new spells, and we have Imperium, which I talked about just a moment ago. Then we also have Whispering Stones right here. So this is something you can give to a city which will start the negotiation process. It will open diplomacy with that specific city, and it will allow you to gain influence with that city, and eventually even integrate it into your empire. So you can turn that city into your own city just through diplomacy, basically. And you can also use a Whispering Stone in your actual city to gain 20 city stability. So right now I could give my capital the Whispering Stone, which means I would get plus 20 city stability. Right now I have 30 and my city is stable. If I give it plus 20, it will become orderly and it will actually gain plus 10% production, draft and food income. So since right now there's nothing else I can really do with this, I might as well give it to my city, to my capital. Now I do have to actually wait for this effect to kick in, but it will be there. So other than that, we also have our city cap right here. Normally you have three, I have plus one because of my race, as you can see right here. And you can increase this by spending Imperium for Empire Development. I'll show you Empire Development in two turns once it becomes available. Here we can see our current gold and our gold income. We can see mana and our income and also what we're spending it on. Right now we're spending 36 for unit upkeep. We can see our world map casting points right here. And here are our empire affinities. And here you have the encyclopedia. So if I want to check out all of my cultural units, I can go into the encyclopedia, pick barbarian, and then I will be able to see all of the cultural units that I will have available. So we have a berserker right here. That's a shock unit. It's an offensive unit specialized in disrupting the enemy line. Shock units have a charge attack, which counters shield units, but can be countered by polearm units. So that's important to note. Shock units are countered by polearm units. Then we have Fury, which is ranged unit. That's, I would assume, self-explanatory with a bow. Then we have a Pathfinder, which is a scout unit used for, you guessed it, scouting. Now, scouts of various cultures have some unique abilities of their own. Art Scout is an outpost builder and can create outposts on the world map. This is not the case for every scout. Ours can do it. We also have Farsight for plus one vision range. And here you can see that it's a scout unit. It has Swamp Walk. It has Rock Walk. It has Land Movement because it's a land unit. It has Forest Walk, and it's a Cavalry unit. Then we have a Sunderer, which is a Skirmisher unit. So Skirmishers are basically cheap and fast units that are useful at flanking and targeting lone enemies. Skirmisher units gain Swift and Slippery. So Swift allows them to ignore effects of terrain in combat, and Slippery means they do not trigger Opportunity Attacks. And Opportunity Attack is a special type of retaliation, which is triggered when an enemy unit leaves the zone of control. 
And yeah, but there are like nested tall tips. You can like open a lot of tall tips if you want. This should probably be like a standard feature in strategy games by now, to be honest. Then we have a ward shaman which is our only support unit. So it's a defensive specialist that supports friendly units from afar and protects them from magical attacks. A support unit will have defense mode warning. It ends the turn and goes into defensive mode. Extends its zone of control to all adjacent hexes. It gives it plus to defense, plus to resistance, makes it immune to flanking, and all adjacent friendly units will gain plus three resistance and the plus three status resistance. It also has Invigorate, which grants friendly units in a one hex radius 10 temporary hit points, strengthened, and regeneration. But it cannot be used when within an enemy zone of control. It also has free turn cooldown. So that's the War Shaman. And then we have a Warrior, which is a shield unit. Shield units gain shield defense, so plus free defense against non flanking attacks, and the defense mode Shield Wall. This unit ends its turn and goes into a defensive mode, extends its zone of control to all adjacent hexes, plus to defense, plus to resistance, immune to flanking, and all adjacent friendly units will gain plus three defense. We do have primal strike because that's part of our like race setup, so first melee attack will deal additional eight blight damage. And that's the barbarian units. Then you can also look at uh, tome units right here. So if we pick Nature of Finite right here. These are all the units you can unlock with Nature Tomes. So we have Druid over the Psycho, which is a support unit at tier 4. We have Flard Stinger, which is a tier 2 skirmisher. We have Glade Runner, which is a tier 3 ranged unit. We have Horned God, which is a tier 5 mythic unit. We have a Nymph, which is a tier 3 support. We have Totem of the Wild, which is a tier 3 tower. Uh, I like how this has no tall tip. <laughs> okay. Literally unplayable, no tooltip. And we have Wild Speaker, which is a support unit. So that's Tom units. And then we have Wildlife, which are units that you normally cannot recruit, but there are various ways in the game that allow you to actually recruit them. One of them are Wonders. So if you annex an Ancient Wonder, you will have opportunities to recruit units that Wonder gives you access to, basically. Here we have all of the structures in the game, you get the idea and all equipment in the game, there's actually quite a lot of it. Okay, so, uh, what's next? Right, we don't have to pick our research. So, two important things here. You can show the Tom library at any time you want. So I can choose Nature Affinity here, for example, and see all of the future Nature Tomes. And as you can see here, in order to get Tier 4 Tomes, you need to have 6 Affinity, in this affinity, so nature in this case, and you can only have one tier 5 tome, and you need 8 affinity for that. So it's not really hard, I mean, I already have 5 in nature, and uh, I need 6. It will be pretty easy to get 6 in pretty much any affinity I choose, even ones I have none in. Anyway, so that's the tome library, and obviously you can also see all of the initial bonuses that you would get from every single one of these tomes which is pretty important. Then there are two things you can do with your research options. So first of all, you can shuffle, which gives you a new set of skills to research. It will cost you 20 mana. And you can also lock one option, which also costs 20 mana. So if there are two skills in here that you really want, you want to guarantee you will have access to researching them, you can lock one of them and it will be there when you finish researching whatever it is that you pick to research. So here our options are Enchanted Crow Companion, which is a unit enchantment for scout units, and it gives them more vision range. We have Poison Arrows, which is a unit enchantment, from the Tomb of Rhodes, obviously, which makes base physical ranged attacks of enchanted units deal plus for blight damage. And we have Poison Blades, which is the same thing, but for melee. So we'll probably go with the melee. Uh, also, uh, one thing I haven't mentioned with city management, which you probably noticed, but you have two different construction queues. We have a queue for actual buildings right here, and we have a queue for units, which I quite like. So this way, if you lose your entire army in a fight, in a big combat with someone, it's not going to cripple you. It will still be a major setback, but it will not completely cripple you. You will not be forced to give up developing your cities and focus on rebuilding your army. 
you can still work on your buildings while also rebuilding your army. So I really like the fact that there are two separate construction queues. I'm actually a really big fan of this. And we'll talk about a few other things in the cities in just a second. But yeah, right now we have access to a scud unit, a skirmisher and a shield unit. And we were looking at the barbarian units just a moment ago over here. So if we look at the barbarian units, vast majority of them are melee units. So we have Sunbearer, which is a skirmisher, that's a melee. We have Warrior, which is shield unit, a melee. We have Berserker, shock unit, also melee. We have one ranged unit, the Fury. We have one support unit, the Shaman. And one Scud unit. So out of six units, we'll have access to. Three of them are melee. And when you hover over uh, the skill to see the tooltip, the tooltip will actually tell you how many units of this type you have in your entire army. I really like this. There are a lot of small things like this in Age of Wonders 4 that I really enjoy. And like UI is often a huge pet peeve of mine, as many of you probably know. I do have a few minor complaints about the UI in this game, but that's just me being nitpicky. Overall, it's really good. It's actually really good. I only have minor complaints. Nothing that would constantly annoy me that I can think of. Right, so let's actually go with Poison Blades first. I think I'll be focusing a bit more on melee here, as barbarians. So we picked our research, then we still have to annex a province. So since we don't have two population, we get to annex a province. It has to be within a certain range of your city, which gets extended as your city grows and expands its town hall. So I believe at town hall level 3, you get plus one province annex range. But right now, since we only have one province right here in the center, we have to annex a province adjacent to it. It probably makes the most sense to move towards this magic material over here. This will give us plus 10 food and plus 10 draft when annexed. Not only that, it will also give us the yields from the improvement we decide to build. So the initial improvement in the province you annex is instant. So as soon as I pick to build a farm, for example, I will get plus five food from that specific farm. And also because this specific province has a pasture, I will also get plus 10 food for annexing a province with a pasture. I do not have to build a farm to get the benefit of this pasture. I just need to annex this province. I can build a quarry, which will give me plus five production, and I will still get plus 10 food from the pasture, just to make that clear. We also have something down here. So, okay, we have iron deposit, which is plus 10 production. That's another option down here. Now, before you pick what improvement you want for the province, there's one very, very important interaction that you need to know about. It's quite possibly the single most important city development mechanic that you need to know about when you start playing. So when you pick what building you want to build, you get told like how long it will take, how much gold it will cost you, how much production it will cost you. However, one of the most important parts here is this last line at the bottom of the tooltip, which is the boost. If you boost a city structure, it will reduce its cost by 30%. And 30% is massive. It's huge. And how do you boost a city structure? You boost it by having certain numbers of province improvements. So if I get a farm, I will boost the workshop. I will also boost the vendor. If I get a forester, I will boost the storehouse. If I get a quarry, I will boost the shrine. You get the idea. This is an incredibly important mechanic. And taking advantage of this will make your city grow much, much faster. You will develop your city way faster if you take advantage of this as much as you can. It's pretty important to plan around this. And the requirement goes up for more advanced buildings, as you might imagine. So for example, in order to boost a merchant's guild, you would need four farms, which, you know, is quite a few. In order to boost let's say an academy here, you would need two quarries and one forester. So in the long run, you will not be able to boost every single building. It becomes pretty important to specialize your cities and know what you, you'll want to focus on. In our capital, I will definitely want to focus on food and getting as much population as possible. And because a workshop is pretty important because it gives us production in the draft, we'll open with a farm. What I'm actually going to do is build a farm right here 
on this province so that I will annex this iron deposit, which will give us plus 10 production, and we'll also get plus 5 food from the farm itself. So this way we get plus 5 food and plus 10 production, like so. And then I can build the workshop right away because we now boosted it. So now I only need 91 production. This boosting mechanic is huge. It's super important to take advantage of it. I can't stress enough just how important this is to plan around it. It will save you a lot of time in the long run, but you need to plan ahead. Anyway, we'll get the workshop to get more draft and more production. This will increase our draft from 23 to 33. And now we can also queue up some units. So you can see why getting plus 10 draft is a pretty big deal here. Then if I can push it to 40 plus, we'll be able to get tier 1 unit in two turns. And again, there's also overflow, which is pretty important, which means we don't have to worry about this excess drought being wasted, because it will not be wasted. We'll still get it as surplus. Right, so let's grab... What do we have right now? Let me check real quick. Right, so we have a war shaman, we have one warrior, and one sunderer. And our main guy is using a sword and a feudal shield. So in that sense, we have two defensive units, if we include our hero. And let's get the Sunderer then, the Skirmisher unit. Yep, that works. This guy also has a Javelin throw, uh, right here. So that has a four tile range. It costs one action, and it inflicts standard defense for three turns, which reduces target's defense and status resistance by one each, and stacks up to five times. So we'll just queue up one for now. Alright, so we don't have a scout here. I could move him into my army, but he's going to scout around. That's his job. And remember, our scout can also build outposts, which I will certainly take advantage of. We also have some resource pickups that we can grab right away. So these things over here, this is just something you have to pick up with your army. We'll do that right away, obviously. So we got a Lesser Snow Spirit, which is literally a skirmisher unit for our army. Okay, there you go. Oh yeah, and one thing I haven't mentioned, as far as the units are concerned, is experience, the rank. So this is pretty important because not only you get bonuses for your units as they gain experience, in the case of some unit types, they can literally evolve into an entirely new unit, into a stronger unit. So this guy, once he reaches champion rank, he will evolve into a snow spirit, which is a tier 3 unit. So that's pretty important to know. And it's pretty easy to miss this. So you need to know about this. So this is actually a pretty valuable unit to get very early on. We should be able to reasonably reach champion, and it shouldn't take super long. Okay, he will join our army, and then we'll grab the other pickup over here. We run out of movement points. I could also grab this pickup uh, with my Pathfinder right away, but let's maybe go in the other direction, shall we? We'll go left. Now, uh, some of the points of interest will be guarded, and because of our map setup, we will get ogres on the map. We can already see a bunch of ogres. And they are not happy. They are not happy at all. With that said, they're not that bad, we can handle them. Now, uh, when we move across these provinces right here, we will get the volcanic heat, which means our unit will not be able to regenerate, and it will suffer minus 3 fire resistance, but gain plus 3 frost resistance. Just something to keep in mind. But with Forming Realm, some of these provinces will transform over time. Here's another point of interest, which is an infestation. So, infestations have like their own domains, uh, the area they control, and they start dormant. They will awaken over time. So, I think you can see some info here on their state. Yeah, right here. So they start in deep sleep. After that, they will become active and start patrolling his domain. Then eventually, it will spawn raiding parties and you will get rid of it by destroying the main spawner in the middle. Once you destroy the spawner, you will get a bunch of rewards. So this is just a small monster then. It's not a huge deal. We just have some inferno puppies. We can go here and take care of it. We also have a mana node over here. We have some Brewer Ogres here, Butcher Ogres. Okay, and they are guarding another magic material. Wait, no, that's the same one I was talking about. 
And they can actually see a list of all the magic materials right here. So we can see the Silver Tongue Fruit right here. And that's the unique global effect for the Silver Tongue Fruit. That's the one. Whispering Stones will give plus one allegiance. And you can check all the other effects for every other magic material. I think we can end our turn now. There's still a lot to talk about, but I feel a little bit overwhelmed at just trying to explain too many things all at once. <laughs> I think we went over a lot of things already. Okay, so let's grab this treasure over here. Oh, yep, there's some stuff going on to the west. We found Robe of Resistance. We can use it right away. That gives us plus two status resistance and plus one resistance. So there you go. And yeah, you can see like tool tips on all of these things. Here's our resistance. It shows us what exactly we get out of it. We get damage reduction and you have a detailed list. Uh, okay, so this transformed into a desert province. Okay, let's move towards uh, this infestation spawner, shall we? And we'll keep exploring. Let's check out this desert province here. Uh, nothing of particular interest over there, just a lot of desert. Okay, we're still building the workshop. And in two more turns, we'll be able to annex another province in one turn now. I'm not quite in range to fight this guy, but we are almost in range. And by the way, when you attack, you can get a three stacks total joining the fight, as long as they are within three tile range. So if I had another army in free tile range, it would join this fight. We can also click this option down here to see exactly which armies would aid you in battle. In some specific cases, you can only fight with a single army. For example, if you find an ancient wonder and you try to clear it, you can only attack it with one army with a hero. But normally, you can join with other armies. Here's a food stash, okay. Oh yeah, and here's Empire Development. So this is a big reason why Affinity is important. You will get this exact amount of points from your Affinity. Right now we have one Chaos, so we will get plus one every single turn to Chaos Affinity. And we have five Nature, so we will get five every single time towards Nature. And it's not enough to just get points. You have to actually spend Imperium to unlock these exact like skills. So you need both affinity and then build up enough, and you need Imperium to unlock various things on this tree. And then we also have the general uh, tree down here, which is a sum of all your affinities. Everyone gets this. This unlocks things like embarking, so you cannot cross any water without basic seafaring, and things like that. So uh, also, some of these are one-time unlock, and others are multiple use. So generally this other part of this branch is multiple use. So here, we have expanded governance, which says right there, it's repeatable. It increases your city cap by plus one. So if you want to increase your city cap, all you have to do is spend Imperium. And you can do it, well, as many times as you like. You can also sacrifice your population, but immediately summon three tier one units. This can be pretty good to get like an emergency army. It's not going to be a very good army, but sometimes it can tip the scales in your favor. It certainly did for me in the past. And yeah, here we got like some other stuff. We have nature, right? Immediately summon a spirit wolf with a guardian spirit and a resurgence in your throne city. That costs 150 Imperium. So that is a tier three ethereal unit. So ethereal units are immune to all kinds of stuff, as you can see right here. They can be quite powerful. It also has pack hunter which means it will do more damage per friendly adjacent unit with Pug Hunter. We have a right of expansive growth, so all cities in your empire will instantly gain plus 10 population, if you spend Imperium, that is. We have a right of awakening, you will instantly gain plus 20 knowledge for each province in your empire's domain. Yeah, you get the idea. And then the last one here is Druidic Empire. Acquiring new population requires minus 50% less food. There are a lot of interesting skills in here. I won't be going over like every single one of them, but these affinity trees are a big part of your strategy and a big part of the decision which affinity to go for. Anyway, right now I don't have enough to unlock anything. And you also use Imperium for free city interaction. We haven't found any free cities yet, so we'll wait until we do. But you can potentially spend a lot of Imperium to vassalize a free city. 
and then integrate it. And furthermore, you also use Imperium to start outposts and cities on your own, and also absorb and capture cities you conquered from somebody else. Just something to keep in mind. Okay, we can end this turn, I think. And I know I'm not playing super quickly, I'm just trying to explain some of the basic concepts. I'm sure I'll miss some details, but I'm trying to explain the important stuff. Okay, here we can do some actual combat. And here's one of my favorite features of this entire friggin' game. I actually love this feature. Uh, actually, hold on. I think we're actually in range. We're in range to get uh, our skirmisher to join this fight. If I attack from here... Yeah, see, he will join this fight because he's highlighted when I hover over this. Because he's within three tiles of the guy who's attacking. Anyway, so here's one of my favorite features of Age of Wonders. Auto-resolve, and wait for it, wait for it, not just auto-resolve. This is not just any auto-resolve. A lot of the games have pretty bad auto-resolve. In Age of Wonders, if you hit auto-resolve, the game actually simulates this fight. Like, on the fly, it does it very quickly, but it doesn't just, like, compare the strength of the units and then use some weird formula to determine who wins, who loses. No, 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 no. It actually simulates the entire fight and then gives you the outcome. Not only that, not only that. So let me press auto combat here. And sometimes there's, like, a five second delay on the really large fights, exactly because, again, it simulates this fight on the fly. Now, when you get the result, right here, so this is the result of the auto combat, you have three options. You can accept this result, you can do it manually on your own, and you can watch the replay. Watching the replay will show you exactly what happened in that fight as it happened. You will see what exactly led to this outcome. So if you get some weird outcome, maybe you're not sure, like, why this, why did this guy take so much damage? Like, why something died when you don't think it should have? You can just watch the replay and you will see exactly what happened. I love the way this is handled in Age of Wonders. Like, I actually love this. We can speed things up. We can uh, rewind right here. Actually, no, this will... Uh, Move it back to the start, fair enough. So, replay, basically. Yeah, so we can see exactly what will happen. And you can leave the screen anytime you want, too. You don't have to watch all of it. You can just close it anytime you want. Okay, so let's see what's happening here. Alright. So these guys are all Inferno Puppies. Alright. Let's speed things up a little. And if you figure, okay, I can do this better, maybe the AI like did some suboptimal moves and you can do it better. You can replay it. Or maybe it got really lucky with this outcome. Then you can accept it. But I really, really like the fact that it's simulated and then you can watch the replay. The auto-resolve itself is actually really good because of this. You will not get some like wildly impossible outcomes. You cannot get an outcome that's, like, literally impossible because, well, it just won't happen due to the fact it's actual simulated combat. In certain other games that I will not name, auto-resolve can give you outcomes that would be literally impossible in, like, actual combat because they use, like, some weird formula where they compare unit strengths, like, they use some arbitrary numbers. There's some weird stuff happening with that. But none of that happens here. Yeah, so here I can actually replay it. If I figure maybe I can do it without losing as much health, again, I can just replay it myself. So let's replay it ourselves, if only because we can talk about combat mechanics. All right. So let's talk about combat. And by the way, combat AI is actually pretty damn good. I'm just saying. Anyway, so every unit has three action points, which you can see right here. You can use two of them to move, and you have to use the third one to attack or use defense mode, like this one over here. You can also see how many action points each skill will use. Right now, all my skills will use a single action point. The main difference between them is that some of them can be used multiple times. That's what this indicator means. It means that if I initiate a malice strike or a shoot bow ability with two action points or more, I will attack twice or three times in a row. 
On the other hand, something like Freezing Burst will only be used one single time, even if I have two or three action points. So, we are fighting some Inferno Puppies. We'll probably let them come to us right now. We also have Volcanic Eruptions because of our world setup. Ready here. So every two turns a marker is placed. Then after one turn the ground will erupt and the units within one tile of the marker will suffer 10 physical damage and 10 fire damage. Random affected hexes will gain on fire. I think it's best if we set up in some sort of choke point. I have two tanky units, my hero and the warrior. My other guys can use some ranged attacks. The units in this location will gain obscured. Right, so it will be 40% harder to hit with ranged attacks. You can use a train like this. Okay, let's set up over here. Over here. And let them come to us for now. And this is where you cast spells. You cannot cast combat spells on turn 1, so you have to wait until turn 2. You also do not have to use this defense mode manually on every single unit. If you end your turn, any unit that still has action points will automatically enter defense mode. Like this. Okay, so let them come. We can speed up up to four times normal speed. This is four times. You can also switch to auto combat if you so desire. Okay, now I could let them come to me and attack me first, which I don't necessarily want. On the other hand, if I charge them, I will potentially be a little bit exposed. But maybe we can kill one on turn one, or rather on the first turn when we engage. The first action should probably be the javelin throw, because it will inflict thunder defense. And minus one defense might not seem like much, but consider that they only have three defense. So minus one is actually a lot, if you consider they only have two to begin with. So okay, let's move in and use javelin throw. And uh, you can see the preview of what your chance to hit will be after you move. Uh, like so, with the ranged guys. So if I move, let's say, here, right here, I will have uh, two action points and I'll have a 90% chance to hit this guy. So I will be able to shoot twice if I go here. I really like this. Okay, so first I need to move either my warrior or marbs before I can move in with the javelin throw, which means I might want to do that. Let's move in with the warrior then. We will get hit with retaliation, but that's fine, I suppose. Okay, we also have primal strike, which means we'll do extra blight damage. Then we can move in with javelin throw, like so. So since this cannot be used more than once, I might as well just move in all the way, get 90%. So that way we'll get thunder defense on the puppy for three turns, right here. Then we can attack with the marbs. That probably makes the most sense here. Okay, 8 damage. I probably want to kill him, but maybe, maybe. We will have a 30% chance of inflicting Frozen, which means that unit wouldn't be able to attack. That is tempting. We also have Invigorate, which can grant a friendly unit 10 temporary hit points, also give them strength and, and regeneration. But I think right now I want to maximize my damage here. So let's attack. That's 10 damage. There you go. I don't think we can kill him. That's not gonna happen. You have 17 hit points, so I actually cannot kill him. If I get lucky, I might be able to freeze him. We can also try to freeze this one, because I can't get 90% on the left. Well, in theory, I might be able to do 14 damage, because we still have the Pathfinder. The only problem is that if I move to the left with the Pathfinder, I might get attacked with one of the puppies in the back, which would be pretty bad. It's a little bit risky, for sure. It would be able to reach me, like, guaranteed. Still, it's an option. The only issue is that I cannot get 90% on that puppy on the left. I think it's best if we play it safe. Let's try to freeze this one. Okay, we uh, did not land the frozen effect, that's fine. And I might just go for a 50% chance from the back. It's a little bit too risky for my taste to move the scout to the left. I don't want to lose the scout. And he's not really that strong to begin with. Okay, and I think that's that. We can still cast Healing Roots or Song of the Reckless. Song of the Reckless would give me plus 30% damage, 
but it would also give my unit berserk, which means I would not be able to control it. So I don't necessarily want that. Okay. There's the explosion on the right side. Let's see what they are going to do. So they are focusing on my hero, which makes sense. And this guy will attack the elemental. That's fine. The other guy will do that as well. Okay. It's good that they are spreading out their attacks. Okay. Now we can cast a heal. Uh, the question is on what, though. I can move out with the elemental, but we will take damage if we do that. It definitely makes sense to move out, though. Because, you know, I don't want to get killed. It was a free unit, but I still don't want to lose it. We can kill uh, uh, this puppy on the left. So let's go with that. This will give us two melee attacks. So that will kill him. It's also a flanking attack. 16 twice. That's good. We also have shield bash. Base 90% of target unit becoming stunned. Cannot use actions or movement. That will be pretty useful if we can stun it. But it will also be bad if I fail to stun it. Let's try to stun it. Okay, that worked. That's good. Now we can actually attack uh, the puppy from the back. From the flank. And I can use a heal. It might make sense to heal our hero instead. We also have Invigorate, which is a heal as well. And I can invigorate both of them at the same time. So I think that makes sense. That definitely makes sense. Let's do that. So this is 10 heal. And then we still have the Pathfinder. He can shoot three times. It's not a ton of damage because, you know, it's a scout unit. He's not supposed to be strong. I can almost kill this puppy. I can almost kill it. I can kill it if I use my Snow Spirit. It's just that the Spirit might get killed itself. It's possible. Okay. Yeah, if I attack three times right now, will that kill it? Yeah, it will, right? No, it won't. It has a pretty weak melee attack. This is not a particularly strong unit. Just saying. It might be best to back up. Okay, let's actually back up. And the defense mode. This is fine, I think. And then we can heal our hero. There. That'll do. Okay. We got this. But it's not really a better outcome than the auto-resolve. So yeah, like I said, auto-resolve is pretty good. It's actually pretty damn good. And again, not only that, you can actually see exactly how that particular result happened. It's one of my favorite features of this game. It really is. I love it. Oh, whoops! I forgot about the guy we stunned. My bad. My bad. My bad. <laughs> I forgot he was still there. My bad. Okay, okay, it's fine, it's fine. We got this under control. That's three attacks, which means we'll kill it. Yeah, I might want to move out with the Pathfinder here. So we will take one attack of opportunity, which is fine. Okay. And that leaves us with the War Shaman. Uh, I guess I'll just stay here. I can move. Again, he will attack me if I move. But I can kind of block the way if I do that. Eh, not really. I guess I'll just stay where I am. And use defense mode. Okay. We'll stay where we are. Yeah, we're good. Again, it's not really a better outcome, though. I really like combat in this game, however. I really like it. And this auto-resolve system is just so good. You will probably hear me say this a lot of times. But this is like the best damn auto-resolve in any 4X game I have ever played. In my life. Ever. It's just that good. This should be standard in every single 4X game with tactical combat. Just straight up. Every single future 4X game with tactical combat needs to copy the way auto-resolve works in this game. It just needs to copy it. Straight up. Anyway, we win. And we didn't lose any units. We took quite a bit of damage. So, like, I, again, I didn't achieve a better outcome than auto-resolve did, but we didn't lose anything. These are our rewards. So we got 26 food, 82 mana and the Wand of Provocation. Grants a 90% chance of inflicting taunted on the target enemy for three turns. Okay. So this will make the unit uncontrollable and force it to attack the unit that taunted it. Right, I can use that for now, because I don't have anything else in that slot. So this is fine. 
Okay, our scout will keep scouting because that's his job. Uh, now, I will not be regenerating while I'm in the Ashlands here, because we will get the volcanic heat, which means we might want to go back into our territory. And by the way, you can see your base region if you hover over your hit points. So right now my total health regeneration is 5. You will regenerate much faster inside your actual territory. Well, right now it's 0 because of volcanic heat. But if it wasn't for volcanic heat, I would only be regenerating 5 hit points per turn, which is not a whole lot. So I should definitely go back into my territory and regenerate properly. So that's what we'll do. We did get a skirmisher unit. So I will add that unit into my army right here. And now we reached free population, which means I can annex another province. So now we could annex this one right here. What does this have? Oh yeah, this one has the silver tongue fruit. However, I will actually have to kill this stack first with the brewer ogre, butcher ogre, and the light bringer. Drink, gain strength and thunder defense. Frigid Belch ability. 90% chance of inflicting Frozen. That's kind of nasty. Yeah, that's kind of nasty right there. Alright. Lightbringer. Oh yeah, Lightbringer has 60% chance to basically mind control your unit, which is pretty bad for you. It's pretty bad for you. So this is not an easy fight. We should win, but we probably won't win with zero losses. Still, this silver tongue fruit is too valuable to ignore it, so we'll want to get that for sure. Anyway, now we can annex another province. I could still annex this one right away. I will not get the benefit of the silver tongue fruit because, again, it's occupied. But assuming we'll be killing that stack in the next turn or two, we can just annex it right now in advance, which I think is a good idea. And because this province has a magic material in it, we have the option of building the conduit or the research post. So let's actually pop the research post. You know me, I like research. On the other hand, I could actually also build a second farm to get some important boosts. We could boost the stone mason, which gives us plus 15 production income. Let's go with that. I like to build up production early on, and you can build both the production and the food at the same time with this mechanic because building farms boasts things like stone mason and then masoning hall and farms obviously give you more food. So in that sense you're working on both at the same time. Uh, where else do we have some resources? We have this iron deposit over here. So we could grab that. That definitely makes sense. We also have uh, this pasture, which is plus 10 food. Okay, let's go with the pasture. We'll build farm over here, which is plus 15 food total. There you go. Now we have plus 69 food. Nice. And now, because we have second farm, the stone mason has been boosted. So we'll build a stone mason. Alright, now, before we attack these guys... Uh, oh, that was pretty bad. I don't think that did any actual damage to me. Right, but it transformed this province into a forest, because that's the mechanic we are using with uh, forming realm or whatever it was called. I don't think you can look at the settings from this level. I'm actually not sure if you can. Uh, maybe you can somewhere. I actually genuinely don't know. Anyway, you get the idea. That's what's happening. It will convert provinces into random stuff. So this is actually pretty nice because we got a forest. In a province, we will definitely want to annex next. Now, I could check what the auto resolve would be from this, but it likely wouldn't be very good for us. We need to go into our actual territory, and now we will regenerate way, way more. We will regenerate 25 inside friendly domain. So that's a huge difference, as you can obviously see. Now, we could grab another unit in three turns. Let's grab another shield unit, so a warrior. We also finished Poison Blades, the unit enchantment. I'll probably want to cast this right away. And then we could get Primal Mark, Vision of Victory, or a Summon. So this is a tier 1 skirmisher unit with Poison Needle. Primal Mark is a skill level 3 unit enchantment. So it grants non-barbarian units Primal Strike. Uh, okay, this wouldn't be super useful for me right now. Vision of Victory gives friendly units in one hex radius free fortune, which is plus 30% critical chance. I like this. Let's go with that. Okay. 
and we are now at 160 Imperium. I could get plus 5 food for all my farms, which probably makes sense, especially very early on. We don't need fruitful integration just yet. We have no need to embark right now. So yeah, let's pick up soil tenders, especially since I already have two farms. So that's even more food for our capital. And we can uh, annex another province right now. So now we could grab this one. What else do we have in here? That's important. We do have this iron deposit. And we'll still get plus one population in three turns. Uh, however, uh, the iron deposit is currently occupied by these guys. So maybe not. We do, however, have one over here. A gold vein. We could grab this. So I could grab a third farm, but I could also grab a mine. Now, you can change your mind later. You can switch uh, the province improvement to a different one. I can't do it right now because I haven't unlocked uh, the special province improvements yet. But once we unlock special province improvements, we can change them to other province improvements which count as certain things. It will make more sense once I actually unlock them. But I mean, you can get an improvement that's technically not a farm, but it counts as a farm. For example, if that makes sense. Still, this is a pretty important decision regardless. Now, a third farm uh, would boast the next building after the stonemason, but we can get farms elsewhere. We actually can't get that many more farms until some of these provinces convert into something else, something more useful than wasteland. Now, I don't have to do it right now. I can wait, but I think I'd rather do it right now because I'm missing out on yields otherwise. Let's actually go for the farm. We will still get plus 10 gold because we're annexing the gold mine. But I'll grab the third farm, especially since we just picked up soil tenders, which is plus 5 food from farms. So now we got plus 78 food. Our city should continue to grow pretty nicely. Okay, so let's cast poison blades. We have three skirmisher units and one shield unit in the army. They will all be affected. It might be best to wait for that before we attack anything. I want to heal up my units anyway. Is there anything we can pick up? Uh, not necessarily. What's this? Arcanium ore. Magic material. Nice. Hoarding recruitment for units is 25% cheaper. Right. So hoarding recruitment is an option. You can do it right here. Right now it would cost me 160 gold to hurry this warrior. That might be useful for the future. Let's keep moving. Here we got Ashen Ruins. Okay, so this is an Ancient Wonder. Uh, ancient Wonders are divided into three different categories, Bronze, Silver and Gold, depending on the rarity, difficulty and value. And Ancient Wonders can be really powerful. They have several different uh, effects, let's just say. So they do give you some yields. It counts as a research post in this case. It would give me plus 5 Imperium, plus 20 Knowledge, and minus 5 Stability. It would also give me plus 5 Fortification Health per quarry in the City Domain. More importantly, it adds the Brewer Ogre and the Butcher Ogre units to the Rally of Legions. So Rally of Legions is something that happens uh, once in a while. Uh, oh yeah, it's not active yet. But once it becomes active, it basically allows you to recruit some units within that specific time window into your front city. And this is uh, what gives you extra units to Rally of the Legions, the Wonders, and also free cities. But if I take over uh, this Wonder right here, the Ashen Ruins, and I build a city, or an outpost, and annex this province, it will add the Brewer Ogre and the Butcher Ogre to the Rally of Legions, and then I will be able to recruit these units once in a while through Rally of the Legions. So that's one of the most important mechanics of Ancient Wonders. You can actually get some pretty powerful units from Ancient Wonders only. And this structure can only be entered and fought by one army led by a hero. Uh, this is the case for every single wonder in the game. You can only fight whatever is guarding it with one single army. And they are usually pretty well guarded, especially higher tier ones. And you will get some uh, rewards for winning this fight. Like once per fight, obviously. Okay, right, so let's wait at least one turn here. I probably want to wait to just get the poison blades, because that makes sense. Okay, so yeah, we'll wait one more turn. But you can see how much health I regained. We got another forest in range, that's nice. We will get plus 4 blind damage. And higher chance of inflicting poison. Yeah, we should just wait. This might be a pretty rough fight. It's definitely tougher fight than the last one. It makes sense to wait. In theory, I could also pay to get this warrior on the next turn. Yep, that makes sense. 
Okay, here we got another silver tongue fraud. And something we can pick up on the left. But it's guarded. Guarded by a river troll and some wisps. Okay. Interesting looking guy. Well, carry on then. I won't be fighting him with a scout. That's for sure. Right, so now I can actually pay to finish my unit. It's only 24 gold because the recruitment is almost done. I can move him right away. And I'll be able to engage with all of these. So now it's going to be a much easier fight. So there's never a reason to not at least check auto combat. Unless you want to retreat. But we'll check auto combat because once you do auto combat you cannot retreat anymore. But if you plan to fight one way or the other, you might as well check auto combat. This is a pretty good outcome. We only really took damage on one warrior. We can watch the replay, but I don't think I can get a better outcome on myself. I'm pretty sure I cannot. So let's watch it. We obviously outnumbered them, but one of them had freeze. Okay, so AI is going pretty hard here. Charged with the hero first. Let's slow down a little. Yeah, the hero can be quite tanky, even this early on. And that's the shield guy, alright, defense mode. This is a nice choke point to fight in. Okay, yeah, two units are frozen. Alright. Looks good. And our other warrior attacked from the back. Yeah, I don't think I could have done it much better than this. Or any better than this. This is a good outcome. We'll accept it. Okay. Right, and now as soon as our city grows, we actually did grow. So now we can claim this province and get the silver tongue fruit. So I think we'll build a conduit, because mana will be pretty important. As much as I'm tempted to also get knowledge, mana is really important. So let's get the conduit. This will also give us plus 10 food, plus 10 draft, and the silver tongue fruit itself, uh, which is uh, more allegiance when we use a whispering stone. Right, uh, we don't have whispering stone in our capital right now, because I assigned it early on. We have 27 stability right now, and we're stable, which gives us plus 5% to yields. You can get buildings that increase uh, your stability, like tavern. Anyway, conduit, that will annex it. And let's grab another warrior here, that's fine. The stone mason is about to finish. The next province will be this one, uh, with the mine, with the iron deposit. And then we could probably claim that Arcanium or to the west, right? Uh, yeah, might be a bit too far. How many provinces away is this? It's free away, we will be able to get it. Might have to wait a bit, but we will be able to get it. So let's stay inside our domain to heal up, and then we'll attack the other troll group. The poison blades are ready, so now we can enchant our units here. You can see that we'll be paying 10 mana in upkeep. But as long as I keep paying 10 mana, we will keep getting this effect. But that's why I built the conduit. 10 mana is quite a bit for me right now. We acquired the silver tongue fruit right here, and our ruler leveled up. Okay, so leveling your heroes is a pretty important part of the game. They can get really powerful later on, and there are a few different categories of like skills and passives. You have Warfare, which basically makes him stronger in combat as a unit. You have Battle Magic, which is kind of the same but with magic. You have Support, which makes him a better supporter. You can give your entire army experience over time. You can get a healing ability over here, restore, you can get more hit points yourself, you can get minus 20% unit upkeep, you can get plus 10% damage, you get the idea. It makes your army stronger as opposed to making your ruler stronger. And we do have intimidating aura because of our setup, so at the end of this unit's turn, at the chance that enemy units have a base 90% chance of losing minus 5 morale. I think I might actually pick up a restore, because not only this can uh, give you a heal, and the regeneration, but more importantly, it removes the negative status effects. I kind of really like that. You can remove negative status effects on any target friendly unit. So let's actually grab that. Okay, let's grab that. That works. Done. Okay, we'll wait one turn and then attack. And we'll keep exploring. We still need to find uh, some other empires. Not that I'm in a huge rush to do that. Here's the watchtower which can give us some more vision. 
and uh, there's an underground passage which leads, as you might have guessed, underground. Underground is a pretty interesting place. Can be a bit dangerous sometimes. We could take a peek. We'll do it at the start of our next turn. It can be pretty dangerous. Alright, let's kill these ogres over here. Okay, so we have some other options here. We can kill them all, which will give us a minus 10, a minus 5 alignment towards evil. We can just remove them. That will give us plus 5. We can conscript them as laborers in our capital. So that will block our draft for 3 turns, but it will give us 271 production in our capital. I like this option. 271 production is a fair bit. We are currently generating 63 per turn. Okay, let's go with that. We'll get production. And I can actually build something instantly as a result. We can build the town hall too instantly as a result right now. Let's go with that, I think. I think that makes the most sense. A blacksmith, 250 production. Right, blacksmith gives us plus 20 draft income. That is an option. Yeah, I think I want uh, the town hall because that will unlock two more units. It will unlock the fury and the ward shaman. So I definitely want that. It will also unlock the tavern, which gives us plus 20 stability and is boosted by two farms and we already have two farms. So town hall and then we can get the tavern instantly for plus 20 city stability. We have 25 currently, so that should push us into orderly. There you go. Yep, orderly. Very nice. So right now we are getting plus 10% to production, draft and food. We are at 96 food right now. That's pretty nice. And then, okay, we could build a wizard tower foundation, which is plus 5 imperium income and unlock some other wizard tower options. That probably makes sense. We could build a vendor to get some more gold. You cannot boss the wizard tower, so let's build the wizard tower. I'll definitely want that sooner rather than later. Okay, we'll wait one turn before entering underground. And now where do we go? Let's zoom out. Okay, so we are here. In terms of our location, we should go somewhere to start an outpost. I could actually start one with my scout. Where are some important resources? We have some silver tongue fruit. Oh yeah, we should start an outpost close to the ashen ruins. I should probably try to just kill whatever is guarding it. And we have a food stash to the southwest. Let's move towards that food stash, shall we? That makes sense. This will heal us back to fall instantly. Now, we are not recruiting the warrior because the draft will be blocked right now due to that event, but that's okay. Not for long. Okay. Uh, that didn't do much, but all right. Let's keep moving. We're back to full health here and we can enter underground. All right, let's enter underground. We have Reaper's Hollow, which is a silver ancient wonder. It has the corrupt soul you need to the Rally of Religious, which is a tier 3 ethereal fighter unit with crushing anguish. Target unit with a morale of low or worse has a chance of dying instantly. Okay. If the unit does not die, it sustains 30 frost damage instead, but this requires all three action points. It also always hits. This is really strong. Okay, this is really strong. Hey, hold on, does it evolve into anything? Uh, no, it does not. Okay, fair enough. It is a tier 3 unit already. Uh, okay. Now you can excavate uh, some of this stuff if you unlock the option to do so right here, excavation. This is what excavation is used for in the underground. You can reach some areas that are otherwise unreachable and maybe find some treasure or maybe find things that want to kill you. Okay, I think right now we'll be leaving. Obviously, I want to clear Reaper's Hollow with one unit. If I really wanted to, I could start an outpost down here. I don't think that really makes any sense right now. Not really. Let's just keep scouting. Now we'll scout to the north, over here or so. Okay. Haunted Halls, another wonder. Silver wonder, okay. Corrupt Soul. We could start an outpost right here, actually. That is not a terrible idea. That is not a terrible idea. Or maybe on this side. We have Arcanium Ore, we have this wonder, we have Iron Deposit to the south. This is not a bad spot. Yeah, somewhere in this vicinity. That's a decent spot. Okay, research is done, so now we can use this buff spell to gain some crit chance. Next up, Wayfinder Enchantment, so that works for scouts. It gives them very fast movement. I don't necessarily care about that, but it is a lot of movement. Vine Prison is a combat summon spell. 
It summons five living vine units randomly in a two hex radius, which live for three turns. They don't deal damage, but have a chance to immobilize enemies. I think I might reroll this. Now, rerolling costs 20. I only have 48, and I'm gaining 12 per turn. But I think I'll reroll. Okay, poison arrows, primal mark, summon entwined roll. I think I'll grab poison arrows. We will have some decent ranged units. It makes sense. We already unlocked a tier 2 ranged unit. The Fury. So poison arrows actually definitely make sense. And this is our ranged unit right now. The Fury, right here. Yep, okay, it makes sense. And then we'll have some in nature, if I continue using nature tomes. Your units regenerate an additional plus 15 hit points per turn in friendly domain, okay? Uh, by the way, we might not actually see a lot of uh, free cities because of the realm setup. There should be at least some, I think, but we might not see a lot of them. Uh, just advance warning, I guess. Okay, let's grab this food cache. Okay, 60 food. That works. And we want an outpost, uh, yeah, somewhere in range of the Ashen Ruins. Probably literally right here. So this will cost us 50 gold. There's not a lot in range in terms of like resources. So it's not going to be the most amazing city ever. We could also have it like here. Okay, this forest might be a tiny little bit better actually. Let's go with the forest instead, to the southeast. We got the wizard tower. All right. So we are still at 51 city stability. Let's keep it that way. We can grab the vendor for some gold. That will take one single turn. And we can annex another province. So that's going to be this one. Now I could get the mine or I could get the quarry. I think we'll grab the quarry. What will that boast? It will boast the shrine, which I definitely want to do. Two quarries would boast the blacksmith. Okay, let's get the quarry. Uh, now, the hut is basically a crappy version of the farm, in case you're wondering. It's not worth using unless it's the only option. Okay, quarry. So this will give us plus 15 total, because we're getting the iron deposit too. There you go. And then uh, we can grab uh, this one, or this one. And then we can get that arcanium ore. Yep, it will take a little bit of time, but we'll get there. So, maybe literally right here on the swamp. I'm just looking at the resources in range. So if I go here, the Wonder will be two territories away. The Iron Deposit will be two territories away. Uh, this deposit will be three away. Uh, that Silver Tongue Fruit, that will be two away. Okay, I like this. So over here on this swamp. All right, and the other one will be on the forest, right here. That's the idea. So build outpost and build another outpost. So this one will be a little bit more expensive because I'm doing it with a Pathfinder. But we're making 129 gold per turn, so it's not that big of a deal. It will take three turns to complete, it's not instant. And this one will take two turns. But we can move while it's happening. You don't have to stay here and wait for it to finish. You can just go elsewhere and let it finish on its own. Okay, we don't have any infestations right now, so there's no need to pick that up. There's no need to pick anything up right now at this moment. We got another warrior, so we'll send him south right away. And we will grow again on the next turn, so that's nice. That's very nice. Let's get that shrine to get more mana. And we can grab a fury, maybe. We do have at least one war shaman, so we'll get a proper range doing it. And uh, okay, I think this is a good moment to wrap up this video. I tried my best to explain as many basics as possible. I hope you found this video useful and enjoyed it, so leave a like if you did. And I will be playing this game a lot more. I will also be streaming it a lot on Twitch, so if you're interested in that, check out my Twitch. The link will be in the video description. And yeah, again, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.